Thanks, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kevin Pefferly, um, because in the States we don't know how to say a PF sound properly. Um, maybe some of you from Germany can teach me later how to say my last name. Uh, I work for a company called 201 Created. Uh, we are a consultancy that specializes in Ember specifically. Uh, the six of us are scattered all over the globe, uh, even though we are located, uh, we're headquartered out of uh, New York. Uh, but I happen to live in Ohio. And if you're not familiar, familiar with the US states, let me use uh, XKCD to help you here. <laughs> Ohio is the underpants of America. <laughs> so that is where I live. Um, back at uh, Ember, Ember Conf, we actually created a schedule uh, app as a demo app uh, to show off a lot of things that were being talked about in the keynote. Uh, it included some uh, includes module unification, file system layout, uh, fast boot, rehydration, uh, a bunch of the things that were pretty cutting edge that we uh, hope to see more widely available and adopted uh, in Ember in the near future. Uh, however, uh, one of the aspects of that app that we did not talk about a lot at EmberConf uh, is that that app was also a fully compliant progressive web app. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that aspect here. And to do that, I actually updated the app for EmberFest. So if you visit this URL uh, on your mobile device or desktop device, but it is optimized for mobile, uh, you'll get a progressive web app that gives you the conference schedule. And also, my biggest pet peeve with conference websites is that I'm on a device that knows the time and knows the day, and it's not like showing me the session that I'm in right now. So, uh, that was my big contribution to this app, is that uh, hopefully as you use it over the next couple days, it will continue to update. Every time you load it, it will uh, take you to the current point in the schedule. But you can uh, view forward and back from there. Uh, so this is, this is our big example app, um, but I'm going to kind of walk through how we, how we did this. Um, and if you, if you happen to open it up, like uh, here are my examples in iPhone, uh, you can click the share button here to save it to the home screen. Uh, if you're on an Android, maybe you get, actually get a pop-up that says like save to home screen uh, prompt. Uh, and you can add it to your home screen. You'll actually get an Emberfest icon that looks like your other apps. And then when you open it up, you'll actually get a much more immersive full screen app-like experience. So this is part of the advantage of uh, implementing the progressive web app uh, standards. So what exactly is a progressive web app? Um, it, uh, according to Google, there are three main criteria for prog progressive web app. Um, the first is that it's reliable, which means that not only does it uh, load consistently, but it also is uh, tolerant of things like uh, bad network connection, uh, maybe being offline completely. Uh, it's also fast. We want it to be interactive as quick as possible. Uh, to not have to wait for a bunch of JavaScript to load or even for the Ember application to start up necessarily. And it also should be engaging, and especially because uh, your users can save it to the home screen and open it up like many of their native apps, see a full screen experience. Um, hopefully this will encourage them to engage with your application even more. So why exactly would we use a progressive web app? Well, uh, maybe Obviously, we're all Ember developers, so we've chosen Ember for some reason. We're creating uh, ambitious, interactive uh, web applications. Uh, maybe you don't have a native mobile team. Maybe you're a new company. Maybe you've just decided strategically that you don't need a nat native mobile app. Um, I, I worked for a product company at one point that was doing uh, mobile healthcare scheduling. And realistically, people do not want a hospital app on their phone at all times. Um, but when you need to schedule an appointment for something, it's really nice that it's uh, mobile friendly, that you can do that from your phone while you're out and about when you need it. Um, however, uh, no matter what application you do, if you have a mobile experience, even if for most users it's a casual one-time experience, you're going to have your uh, hardcore users who are going to want to have easy access to your application um, on the go. So uh, implementing the PWA spec, and really, PWA uh, is not just for that, for that type of uh, experience as well. Uh, similar to like when we implement accessibility, it benefits non, uh, 
non-disabled users as well. Uh, accessibility gains us all an advantage. Similarly, PWAs do too. Thank you, Martin, for this softball of a tweet from yesterday <laughs> that uh, being, on, being on a plane sometimes is a bad network connection. Sometimes being at a conference and being on conference Wi-Fi is not a great network connection. Um, by implementing some of these uh, standards, we can uh, gain these advantages, not just uh, when we're talking mobile specific. So how exactly do we do this? How do we, how do we uh, achieve uh, progressive web app compliance? Um, the main tool that we use is uh, Google, uh, Google's Lighthouse. Um, if, you're, if you've not used this tool, uh, run against your, your applications. Um, it was originally a Chrome extension. You can actually see that I have it uh, installed up there at the top. Um, but now it actually exists right inside of the uh, Chrome developer tools, uh, inside of the audits tab. You can run these audits yourself on your current project right now. Uh, one downside of running Lighthouse inside the browser is that uh, performance is affected by all of the add-ons and extensions you have installed in your browser. So if you have uh, ad blockers or even the Ember uh, inspector or something, it could possibly affect performance. So especially if, you, if you're trying to do some of the performance tuning stuff, um, I would highly recommend uh, looking at the CLI uh, Lighthouse is available as an NPM package, and then you can run it from the command line just using Lighthouse and giving it a URL, and it will spit out the report in HTML. Uh, so the EmberFest, uh, the EmberFest progressive web app that I've just pointed you at, uh, we've achieved 100% PWA compliance as well as accessibility and a, a lot of these other things uh, with very little effort. Um, but for this example, I'm going to walk us through how we would implement a progressive web app on the simplest uh, Ember application we have, which is when we create a new Ember application, we have the uh, welcome page, and this is as easy as it gets because it doesn't require any work on our part to get to this point. So when we load up the Ember welcome page on a brand new Ember app and then run the Lighthouse audit, we end up with a progressive web app score of only 46. So obviously we've got a lot of work to, go, uh, to do from here. Uh, some of the things we, we pass right away, so page load is fast enough on 3G, it has a meta, meta viewport tag, that's something that's uh, provided for us in the default blueprint in our index HTML. Uh, content sizes correctly for the viewport. And then um, Lighthouse happens to give us a pass on localhost for the HTTPS. But there's a whole lot we fail. So uh, you can see some themes here, uh, offline access, uh, there's some things in here referring to a manifest that we're gonna need to figure out, um, service workers, so we're gonna, need to, we're gonna need to deal with all of this. Uh, the first one I wanna deal with is that, um, number five there, is does not provide fallback content when JavaScript is not available. Uh, luckily for us in the Ember ecosystem, this is something we can do uh, that we can do uh, much easier than some other ecosystems. Uh, so when we're trying to do a JavaScript free uh, render, obviously we use Fastboot. So you can do this uh, by running a Fastboot server, uh, which your app may already be doing, um, or if you are doing a uh, simpler deployment process using an index HTML of some sort, we can also use Prember to uh, pre-render the Fastboot content and deliver it uh, right inside of our index HTML file. So for the, uh, for the welcome page app here, I'm I, I would do an Ember install Ember CLI Fastboot and an Ember install Prember. Um, Prember itself takes just a little bit of configuration. You have to tell it which URLs you're going to uh, have it pre-render before you upload them to your server. And if you happen to be use prem, uh, if you happen to be using Prember, uh, there's an environment variable that can allow you to activate it in your local development as well. Uh, Fastboot these days automatically will work with your with your Ember serve. You don't it doesn't require any additional um, setup there. So once we've got our application rendering with Fastboot, uh, we've now run our audit and we see that we're up to 50. 
That's a lot better. Um, so we see that the contains some con sorry contains some content when JavaScript is not available. Uh, check passes, but we still have a handful of other things to deal with. Um, the offline uh, aspect here is actually related to the service worker aspect. So that's the aspect we will cover next. Um, a service worker is itself a, an API into the, the browser that allows you, your application, to do some things that may not uh, typically be available. Um, this can include things like uh, push notifications and background refresh but the use case that we're going to leverage Service Worker for here is specifically offline caching. So again, thanks to the uh, Ember uh, add-on ecosystem, we have Ember Service Worker from our friends at Dockyard. And uh, this gives us a lot of out-of-the-box plugins to implement uh, v various pieces of caching. Uh, the Ember Service Worker add-on is the core add-on that registers the service worker with the browser. Uh, there's Ember Service Worker Index, which can cache your index HTML. Uh, asset Cache uh, caches everything that's inside of your assets directory. And uh, Cache Fallback can be used to actually cache uh, things like API endpoints, so that if you have a dynamic application that's loading from, from an API, uh, which most Ember apps are, uh, you can also cache those responses and fall back to them when needed uh, if network uh, connections are poor. There's also a cache first uh, add-on if you're in a situation where you actually want to use the cache um, and avoid the network when possible. So for the, uh, for the welcome page app, uh, I would install the Ember Service Worker, Service Worker Index, and Service Worker Asset Cache. And again, a very minimal amount of config here because the uh, Tomster image on the welcome page is actually not inside the assets directory. Uh, it's loaded from Ember welcome page images directory. So we need to add that to the asset cache config. So then if we run our Lighthouse, uh, our Lighthouse uh, score again, we get a score of 73, so more progress. So we see here that uh, we get response with the 200 with when online has been added. Uh, we see that we've registered a service worker there, number five. Uh, so we're making progress. So we're now up to seven out of 12 past audits. Uh, what's left is uh, we've definitely got a few here that are mentioning a manifest here. Uh, and though we now have a service worker, the service worker itself is not serving the manifest start URL. Uh, so that's an issue we've got to address now. A web app manifest is a file that uh, communicates to the browser a number of preferences we have that specifically refer to installing an app to the home screen. So uh, we'll show what some of those things are here shortly. Uh, again, the Ember add-on ecosystem is our friend. Uh, the Ember web app add-on uh, helps uh, configure a manifest.json. It also, it, can inject some additional meta tags that are useful for uh, platforms like iOS to communicate some of these preferences. So if we Ember install Ember web app, we get a config inside of our config directory for our manifest. And here we're defining a whole bunch of our preferences. So the name and the short name are, are names that are used, for example, under the icon on the home screen there. Um, the uh, standalone display is what allows us to take over the full screen of the device when launched uh, from the home screen. Uh, theme color can be used in uh, uh, Android Chrome to actually change the tint of the browser uh, Chrome to match the theme of the website. And in this particular case, I'm only defining one icon. I'm just grabbing the, uh, the construction Tomster and returning it as, as an icon. Uh, but there are different icon sizes uh, that if you look into the, the documentation around uh, the manifest add-on, uh, there are different sizes that uh, different platforms prefer uh, for their home screen experiences and launch screens. So we do that, we're now up to 92. So we're almost there, we're so close. Uh, we now have 11 out of the 12 audits passing. And the one that we have left is that uh, 
we are not direct redirecting HTTP traffic to HTTPS. Obviously, this is a difficult one to achieve locally. You could do a lot of work to achieve it locally, but probably not worth it just to get this audit to pass. Um, I would recommend focusing on your deployment at this point, uh, getting your deployment server uh, redirecting HTTP to HTTPS. And once we do that, we have a 100% compliant progressive web app. Woo! <laughs> so I, I encourage you to check out our, uh, our demonstration here at emberfest.201created.com. Uh, there is a link, uh, there's a little modal that'll, or a little uh, footer that'll pop up actually linking you out to the source code if you're interested in that. If you dismiss that and it stays away for, should stay away for 24 hours, also down at the bottom of the schedule there's a link to the, to the GitHub if you'd like to dive into a little bit of a more real world example that we have available for you here. Um, one bonus uh, question that I've gotten uh, when I show the schedule app specifically is that um, there is some styling magic we're doing here to avoid the notch because Apple decided that screens should not just be rectangular anymore. Um, uh, so something uh, I'll just throw in here as a, a added uh, tip is that in order to dodge the notch, uh, there are a number of environment uh, variables uh, available to us specifically on iOS. Uh, safe area insets, top, bottom, left, and right. The way that we use these is uh, in your CSS, you can set a padding. So here for the header, for example, I have a half of a rem uh, padding on the top. And then right afterwards, I can kind of override it using uh, CSS calc here. I'm grabbing the ENV variable of the safe area inset top and then adding that to the half of a rem. Uh, and for browsers that don't support the environment variable or calc, they'll just like they'll just ignore that. And really, the only the only browser that will even pay attention to the second line of this is Mobile Safari. So all of the other browsers will still behave as we'd expect. Um, but for Mobile Safari, this gives us that extra padding to dodge the notch. Um, similarly, on each of the individual sessions, when you saw the sideways rotation, uh, we can do the same thing with the uh, left and right margins. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I'm Kevin Pefferly. These are my uh, contacts here, Kay Pefferly on most platforms. Uh, and please uh, let us know uh, if you're looking for help with your application. Uh, we at 201 Created would love to help. And we are available at these. Thank you.